Our next speaker is not only an accomplished leader, but also a top strategic thought leader and evangelist in the world of digital transformation with a focus on Industry 4.0, manufacturing operations, and the factories of the future. During his impressive career at Siemens, Infineon, and Kimanda, he perfected his expertise in optimizing highly complex discrete manufacturing operations. Notably, in 2004, he led the groundbreaking migration of an MES system within a running high-volume facility. Stairway to Industry 4.0, a journey through hype and reality, is a look into the realities and possibilities of Industry 4.0 from the CEO of Critical Manufacturing, the visionary Francisco Almada Lobo. Your applause, please. Thank you. Not sure if I like being called visionary, but... Uh... Okay, so it's really impressive. I, I'm, I really like being on stage, but of course, seeing all of you, uh, you know, the view from here is, is really terrific. Um, and it's so good being among customers, uh, partners, colleagues, friends, uh, and even family. <laughs> Um, so a stairway to Industry 4.0, because, and I think we saw this today several times, uh, this is a journey, and it's quite obvious to the majority of the persons here um, that we are in the very beginning. We have a very steep path ahead of us, and we're still on the first steps. So everything started, and let me go back to the beginning of the journey. Everything started uh, in 2011. Actually, the first report that I had access to was this one in 2013, uh, and this was the result of a consortium, of a public-private consortium in Germany, and it was presented at the uh, Hanover Fair. And so this report is available, and I encourage all of you to read it, because it shows everything that started there and how we are treating it today. But let me give you a quick summary, three bullet points about what's there if you don't have time, okay? Bullet point number one. Germany is the powerhouse of manufacturing in the world, specifically in the areas of automotive and machinery. The Internet of Things and several developments in technology will open up a complete new set of possibilities that will allow companies to do much more personalized products to the individuals. This is where Germany is going to put all the money, and Germany will continue to be the main powerhouse of the world. So obviously, there was a lot of excitement, and everyone started saying, okay, let's look and see what, uh, what Germany is doing. Then there was a little bit of help by some other entities, a little push. The first one came from the World Economic Forum. They said that by 2020, five million persons would lose their jobs because of the fourth industrial revolution. Then later, some additional entities gave a little bit of help. Foxconn said that they will replace 60,000 workers by robots. By the way, none of this came true. Nevertheless, you know, everyone started going through their industry for auto programs in every country. Almost every country had an industry for auto program. Okay, let me highlight just two or three here. One was, is the Smart Manufacturing Leadership Coalition, the US-based program, which basically um, was there more or less at the same time and came to, the similar, to very similar conclusions. Second one is the Made in China 2025. Why this is important? Because they put so much investment into it, they put more investment into it than all of the other programs together. And third, the Industria 4.0, Portuguese one, I was proudly part of this, but unfortunately did not uh, yield the results uh, that were uh, originally planned. So nevertheless, all these programs fueled even more interest in the industry for auto. And you can see here the relative search interest. And I would like to highlight two things here which are interesting. The first one is that the interest decreased after the pandemic. The second one is that industry for auto got much more interest as a term than smart manufacturing. So for once in a lifetime, 
Germany was better in marketing uh, than the US. <laughs> okay, and so after that, a lot of technologies popped up. We heard about many of those here today. Big data, augmented reality, um, even some that are not here, like blockchain and so on. But nobody talks about ERP, MES, CRM. Where is Jeff? Jeff said that I could not say this in less than three seconds. Uh, so there's so many different applications out there, but it seems like some of those have been forgotten, and we're just talking about the new things. Um, so it was a great fertile ground for consultants and for technology and for startups. So there was a very big investment hype. You can see here uh, the relative interest. New startups were being created, new startups were being acquired, lots of new VC money put into it, lots of investment rounds. In any case, you know, there was an excitement that we had not seen before in the industry. But there was a lot of criticism as well. All of these technologies already existed, right? Walter Pitts and Warren McCulloch, they created the first neural networks of the human brain in 43. <laughs> it was a long time ago. Even the more sophisticated deep learning backpropagation algorithms came in the 80s, right? So a long time ago, way before this industry for a revolution. There were some other persons that were talking about some of these things a long time ago. Joseph Harrington, 1973, a great year, by the way. Um, he was the first to come up with concepts like CAD design, production control, quality control, scheduling, maintenance, all of these that we do today and is part today of the MES and the MOM space and the software space within manufacturing was created in 73 already. And one of my favorite heroes, John Golovin, created the first successful MES system called Workstream, or first was called Comet, then Workstream. Uh, he, he, he hit 60% market share within Semiconductor. Many of the persons here did work with this. Anyone who has worked with Workstream? Wow. I worked with it as well. And so, if this happened so long ago, why only now? Why now this industry for our excitement? And the answer is, well, now we have the technology. There's a chart from the HP Megatrends. Unfortunately, this report, which was a great report, the last one that I know of came out in 2020. I'm not sure if there's reports after that. But it basically shows that you know, every 10 years, the processing power for 1K will increase by 1,000. Every 20 years, by a million. And every 30 years, by a billion. What this means is that per 1K, in 2010, we could do the equivalent to an insect brain in terms of calculation. If you go forward, in 2030, a human brain will be possible to have the same number of calculations per 1K. And then, around 2050, all of the human brains together. Right? So this is a huge um, uh, acceleration. And so, where everyone said, okay, so now we have this technology, let's go ahead and start. So how do we start? That's where consultants came in. Let's do some pilots. This is a chart from McKinsey. Every good consultant chart has four quadrants. Okay, this one has four quadrants as well. And it says, you know, let's go and see which ones are the priority ones, which ones do you have more return, which are easier to implement and get more return. And so let's do a few, a few pilots. In many companies, this is now uh, some data from uh, LNS research, were showing that many companies were doing pilots or POCs at a specific use case level, at a pilot level, at a site level, sometimes at a corporate one, but they were doing pilots and pilots and pilots. Well, despite the excitement with those pilots, many did not work. And we heard about some of this today. McKinsey called this the pilot purgatory. Do you know what purgatory means, right? So the purgatory is a place where the suffering souls are trying to expiate their sins. That's basically what's happening here. So the purgatory exists because there are challenges. Gartner put together a few of those challenges. Some of the challenges are technology related. You can see here cybersecurity as one of them, the legacy systems, integration, scalability. But there's also organizational and cultural challenges, which I believe are even more important. 
leadership commitment, access to skills, cultural resistance, and we heard about some of those today. So what this means is that it's a little bit more than just technology, and some of it has to do with strategy. And so the last pillar of this uh, data from, from, from Gartner is about strategy. And so you see available budget, insufficient just investment justification. Can we demonstrate our ROI? So those are the main reasons why you know, some of the things did not go forward and failed. So all of it relate, relates to strategy or to the lack of it. So because of all these disparate situations that we have, all these pilots, all these results and so on, that's why frameworks started to exist. And I did not uh, align with Nick Leader, but I have two slides on Siri. I had a few jokes about Siri that I will skip because they use them all. Uh, but essentially, uh, the reason why I love this model is because it has the best set of formulas. This is an engineer's dream. So you can really define based on benchmarks, based on where you are, based on the costs, based on the investment priorities, what are the areas to address in order to have a little bit more maturity. However, I wanted to highlight a little bit one of the charts that he showed. Because you can see the digital maturity by segments. And we heard here today a lot about semiconductor. Um, we started hearing about medical devices. We'll, steer, uh, we'll still hear about electronics uh, in industrial equipment and in some other areas. And you can see that today we have semiconductor as being the number one in terms of maturity. However, you can see that there's a certain variance. So this means that not all semiconductor are the same. So even within semiconductor, they are more sophisticated and less sophisticated, more mature and less mature in digital terms. The second one is electronics. And look at electronics. Electronics is staggering. Why? Because it has a very high maturity, right below semiconductor. But look at the variance. It means, again, that there are companies that are very mature in digital terms and some others that are way uh, immature. And then you, something that you don't see here is the evolution. So semi was always number one, but electronics from 2019 to 2022 raised from number three to number two, and pharmaceutical came down. And the other one which is interesting is medical. Medical was number five in 2019, and it's now in number eight. Okay, so it's very interesting to understand all these dynamics going on. So not only maturity, mostly relatively low, that the gaps from the leaders to the laggers uh, uh, are, are also very important, but also priorities are changing. And look at this. I mean, of course, we had some extreme situation. COVID was the most extreme situation and, you know, shook everything up. Before, the, before COVID, the reasons for digitalization were basically cost and efficiency. And all of a sudden, it was not any longer. And resilience, flexibility, and transparency became priority number one. So, you know, so much for the companies. But look at the companies that decided to go for one specific use case. Is that use case still relevant today? So, the point is, we may not know what we're going to need for the future. And so we better be prepared for multiple things that can take place. And this is the same in manufacturing, right? So, you know, we're coming, I, I'm coming here with an example to you, which comes from a completely different field. It comes from aviation. KLM. KLM wasn't looking to simply do one use case in, in their digital program. They were looking to not necessarily just to reduce flights, waiting times, or fuel consumption, or on-time uh, flying of passengers. You know, basically what they've done they said, we're going to do you know, a holistic digitalization of the entire set of processes so that we have data coming from all different angles so that in the future we can have the possibility to make many decisions. They call it a systemic win-win across a variety of organizational facets. So essentially what they did is they created a platform. And so what we need is a platform, is what we call a backbone for potentially in the future having different dispersed type of objectives. Of course, in manufacturing, these are some of the main backbones. Manufacturing execution systems shouldn't come to you as a surprise. This is one of the main uh, backbones. 
but you can also see um, PLM, you can also see IoT platforms, um, local automation. You know, all of these are really important baseline projects that will enable the future development, that will enable the future digitalization. So it's easy. So this is what we need. Okay, let's start and let's go and, and do it. However, what's the problem? The problem is that these projects are challenging. These projects are difficult. Everything which is so transformational is very, very difficult. And we saw here today Michael Kaiser talking about some of the challenges, and also in the past some others. So it's, uh, this is very difficult. And guess what? Big projects, big enterprise projects that have multiple objectives do fail sometimes. So I have here a few examples about failure, but I will not talk about failure of MES, um, just because I will embarrass some of our uh, competitors. But I will show um, failures in the ERP space. And I must say, I had a lot of fun uh, looking at those. First one was Revlon. So Revlon, there was a merge with uh, Elizabeth Harden, or it was an acquisition with uh, Elizabeth Harden. Revlon was using Dynamics AX, and um, uh, Elizabeth Harden was using Oracle. And the decision that they've done was a very smart decision. So let's do a third ERP. Okay. And so basically, you know, everything went wrong. They were unable to fulfill orders, and they got, you know, 64 million unfulfilled orders. This is a disaster. And they were sued by their own shareholders. This is unheard of. Here's a second example, Nike. Here the problem is a little bit different. They decided to do a very rushed implementation where they were connecting their SAP system into the supply chain I2 in order to have better predictions in the supply chain. This went so bad that they start giving false orders to all the manufacturing in the supply chain while they failed completely on the Air Jordan that was being launched. So we're talking about here again, 400 million spends. They took, at the end, seven years to recover in 50 million, and 500 million. So what I like about the RP fail is that when they fail, these guys fail big. Right? Here's another one, Lidl. Lidl is very recent. I think most of you remember because it was on the newspapers not so, so many years ago. And this one is very interesting because it resembles many of the problems that we do have also in, 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 um, in MES projects. So Lidl decided to change one of the core elements of SAP. They decided to base its inventory on um, purchase prices where, when SAP does it on retail prices. Very small, this is just a very small customization. And the very small customization grew because everything was connected to this. And it grew and grew and grew. And everything at the end was completely customized. Here's the result. Seven years, 580 million, and the project got canceled. The final one is not that sexy, but it's the leader of failure, which was the US force um, with Oracle. And they invested five billion and uh, also the project got cancelled. Okay, so you can see what, what we're talking about. Many of the things, and when we talk about MES, many of the things are similar because there are some challenges. Here's three of them that I'd like to highlight. One is called paper on glass. And we heard here today, sometimes yeah, we have everything being done by paper, and the only thing we know, want, is to, based on this paper, do something in system. Okay? This is usually um, dangerous. Um, the second one is one of my favorites, which is called the XY problem. Be why? Because it's my favorite because we, I have it all the time, and we're even launching an internal program at Critical to, to change this dramatically across many implementations, which is a customer, instead of explaining what the X problem is, they're explaining what the Y solution is. Why? Because they have consultants before. They started working on requirements way before they even selected the system, right? And then they are forcing things to go in a certain direction, and, of course, then we have a disaster after that. And the final one is gold plating, very well known, which is working on a task past diminishing returns, um, and so this is very well known. However, there are also projects that succeed, okay? And here are a few examples. This is a very recent uh, uh, survey by uh, PwC, 
And you can see that both in the IIoT, PLM, local automation, and MES, there are successful implementations that get, first of all, sometimes ROI results within a very short time frame. And they have, you can also see that there is an average uh, payback. So three things to say about that. First, of course, the simpler projects have faster ROIs. I loved what Michael said before, that um, the decision for Bibron was, no, I just want the digitalization. So I will not measure ROI. Okay? I, I don't know how many persons, for instance, in companies have done ROI for deciding to implement an ERP system. To a certain extent, that's the cost of doing business. In digitalization today, the cost of doing business requires very significant investments. And second, you know, I'm, I'm an engineer. I can do whatever ROI analysis that you want. And I also have great Excel skills. <laughs> Third, you know, it's really difficult or impossible to assess you know, the impact caused by a digital transformation program. Because it's so transformative, because it goes so beyond what we are already seeing today. So again, after the backbone, you know, we deploy, and then we go into the next step. And executives are all talking about something that we discussed here today, uh, which is AI. Right? So AI was always the main thing, uh, even before the pandemic, and continued to be so. So everyone wants to get some sense out of the data, and very few understand that digitalization is actually the backbone, the basis for being able to do properly AI. So, you know, and also some of the, you know, the first and quicker examples of trying to do AI may not yield the desired results. I'm going to show a picture that is shown in lots of places. Okay. So virtually all the leading technology companies claim um, that they can democratize uh, AI by offering very easy to use APIs. And there are some guys in the internet that decided to share some of the work that they have done and try to um, show the results of this challenge, which they call the Chihuahua or Muffin Challenge. Okay, I, I don't need to tell you that the results can be very dangerous, um, so be careful when doing this at home. But to test this, they use several different APIs, and the APIs then return with a certain high confidence uh, the results and the tags. So this is the results across a number of different uh, uh, results, and I would like just to highlight one here, which is this one from Microsoft identified this muffin as a close-up of a stuffed animal. <laughs> I'm not sure if you have people here from, from Microsoft, but this happened across a number of those. I, beyond the close-up of a stuffed animal, there was the other one on top that says, a brown and white teddy bear. So the point here that I'm trying to make is that, you know, even two-year-olds um, can't distinguish muffins from chihuahuas, right? So why is that? Because the problem is that they have additional information. They have additional contextual information. They can add additional data points and feed, you know, additional information that the systems they are using the APIs don't have. This process is known as data enrichment. So data enrichment is defined as merging third-party data from external sources into the sources that we are analyzing. And this started with social media. Social media, all customer, all data, every time that you are interacting with social media, you are adding data points to your profile. You've got to be very careful with what you do. Because every time that you go on social media, on Facebook, on LinkedIn, you click stuff and so on, they are adding and they are putting additional data on your records so that they can do something with this data. This is also very heavily used in the CRM business. We're heavy users of CRM. So if we have a target account, a target company that we want to address, we have some basic information about them, but then everything else comes on top. For instance, in the medical device space, if there's FDA recalls, FDA recalls are automatically added to those data points. So we know if there's a lot of FDA recalls, this company is in trouble and it's probably you know, a good subject uh, to, to talk about. Insurance. This is the Eldorado. Of course, it crosses many ethical aspects, 
But if we can get additional information from the telematics of the car, we can have much more data in order to define what's the right insurance level. As some, some years ago, Tesla was wanting to get into the insurance business because they were getting additional information from the car and were deciding if they could have cheaper uh, insurances made to, uh, to customers. So in, in our space, we also need to do data enrichment. So if you have AI, if we have relatively uncontextualized information that may come from equipment, the number one contextualized layer is MES. MES is able to provide you the information around and that can then be then filled with additional uh, information that will come then from the specific data points from equipment. And I have here a few examples. For instance, the creation of predictive models for yield and performance based on equipment, MES information, or uh, the application of predictive models to tune parameters for optimal yield performance. Each industry will know how much of these things make sense and the specific domain knowledge which is needed is incredibly important. MES is a backbone, but it's more than a backbone, right? It's a layer of information, and if we start doing, if we start doing this AI journey, um, having uh, information on top of that, we have uh, much more possibilities to create value and generate insights. So the final topic that I have today is, you know, if, if we have all this AI, um, and we discussed this even today in the, uh, in the, in the panel, uh, will we need workers at all? And we go back to this um, original discussion and this original prediction from the World Economic Forum. And whenever I talk about this topic, there's one study that I love to show. This is still available. It's called The Future of Employment, and it was done in 2013. What's beautiful about this is that it classifies basically every job in terms of social intelligence required, creativity, and the perception and manipulation needed. And then what's interesting, it has an annex with you know, hundreds of pages that shows almost every job and what's the likelihood, what's the probability that this job is going to be automated in the future. And then, of course, it's very fun to start seeing you know, the results. Telemarketing call center, 99% probability of automation. I mean, we're seeing that, so this one shouldn't come as a surprise. Cashiers, accountants. I showed this once into uh, a group that I thought was, you know, a lot of people coming from different areas, but it turns out that half of them were accountants. So it was a, a, a great success. So I told them that 94% 90, probability their job will be gone. Drivers, cooks, but look at the last one. Computer programmers, code generation. This was already like that, and there was not even ChatGPT that today can generate code easily in any language. Can it do a good job? I don't know. So the World Economic Forum now is saying, OK, it's not exactly as we predicted. Yes, there are going to be a lot of jobs that will be gone. However, there's going to be additional jobs that this new technology uh, will create. And I have here a few examples, like big data analytics, uh, like robots, and so on. So it turns out that even though technology may replace some jobs, may shift people, um, they need other types of jobs, other type of people. And so, you know, this sentence that we heard um, often, which is, um, workers are going to be replaced by AI, turns to be wrong. Workers are going to be replaced by other workers that use AI. So this is what's, what's going to happen. OK, so one last thing, because we heard about Industry 5.0 today um, from DDA in the morning. And essentially, I don't think Industry 5.0 makes sense, the way it was um, uh, conveyed by the European Commission. So this term has been coined by the European Commission now, and it basically says that it's, we're going, talking about the same things as Industry 4.0, but with a societal impact. We're talking about the environment, the, uh, the workers, um, and everything else. And there's nothing in the Industry 4.0 that says that this is not the case already in the Industry 4.0. However, 
I think this curve shows something that I would like to, to, to explain here, which is this is a, a chart that shows the productivity growth and some projection. So if industry 4.0 relates to the fourth industrial revolution, what this means is that the productivity gains should have been exponential. And they are not in any way. You can see they are very close to a linear projection. So this means we are really at the beginning of the journey. We have not even started. We are giving the first steps towards the fourth industrial revolution. So summing it up, we're on a journey. The journey is full of bumps, steep climbs. However, um, you know, it's one that we have so much pleasure getting in. Just bear in mind that you need a strategy and you need a backbone. Of course, MES is a great backbone. And that's, of course, obviously one of my main messages. Or at least some MES are. Mind problems like gold plating, paper on glass, XY problem, customization trap. This will cost you money. This will cost you delays. Um, and sometimes unnecessarily so. And finally, then after you deploy the, the basics, after you put things to work, evolve through iterations. You don't know what the future holds, so let's go step by step. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.